You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. It is a dangerous world out there. Volatility is on the rise, and your clients' portfolios are under assault from a growing number of threats. Simple diversification is no longer enough to shield the assets under your protection. Registered investment advisors, financial planners, and asset managers need a new weapon in their war on risk. Welcome Welcome to to the the Advisor's advisor's Option, option. the program designed to arm busy advisors with the information necessary to properly manage risk in this volatile environment. From options education, trading strategies and tips, to industry news and interviews, you'll find it all on the Advisor's Option. The Advisor's Option is brought to you by the Options Industry Council. The OIC was created to educate investors and their financial advisors about the benefits and risks of exchange-traded equity options. For more information on how the OIC can help you implement options in your practice, please visit optionseducation.org. The Advisor's Option is also brought to you by Swan Global Investments. Since 1997, Swan has been the leader in hedged equity and option income strategies with GIPS verified results. Swan provides unique and valuable solutions to the inherent weaknesses of asset allocation, offering defined risk strategies that allow upside participation while also protecting advisors and investors against market risk. For more information about our advisor program for separately managed accounts, Swan defined risk mutual funds, or our proprietary option overlay strategies, please contact Randy Swan at swanglobalinvestments.com. Think outside the style box. Think Swan when deciding on risk management solutions to market risk. The advisor's option is also brought to you by Option Research and Technology Services. ORATS is your source for options backtesting. It's where you turn your ideas into results. Founded on the floor of the SIBO over two decades ago, ORATS is a full-service option research firm focused on helping you develop options strategies in line with your investment objectives. With a state-of-the-art backtesting platform, scanning, and implementation tools, ORATS offers end-to-end option strategy development making the whole options trading process easier. For information about backtesting, scanning, options data, including dividends and earnings, visit ORATS.com or email Matt Amberson at Matt at ORATS.com. And now, it's time to learn how to implement options in your practice. It's time for the, the Advisor's, advisor's option. option. All right, everybody, that music means it is time once again for the Advisor's Option, the program where we break down all of the fascinating, intriguing, sometimes intimidating things going on in the world of options and explain how you can use these crazy products in your own portfolios and indeed your clients' portfolios. My name is Mark Longo from theoptionsinsider.com as well as, of course, from the ever-exciting The Options Insider Radio Network. Pleased to be back on the old advisor's option. It's a fun one. I'm always happy to hop on this program. And joining me on this fine program once again to kick off the new year, indeed the new decade, 
of the advisor's option. How crazy does that sound? <laughs> I'm joined by my usual compatriots, my partners in crime. Starting off, let's go out to the land of the earthquake swarm these days, a.k.a. Puerto Rico. We are joined once again by the director of risk himself, also the portfolio manager over there at Swan Global Investors, Mr. Investments, excuse me, Mr. Chris Hausman. Chris, welcome back to the program. And for all of our listeners who are concerned, how are things going in Puerto Rico amidst all the various uh, natural issues that have been occurring of late, sir? Well, thanks for having me back on the show here and I hope everyone had a good new year. Yeah, we got uh, some surprises uh, the last few weeks here with a lot of quakes. Um, You know, the area that we're based uh, southeast side of the island is we did feel those quakes, but fortunately, no major damage in this area. It's really the southwest side that's getting hit and um, something's going on because they're definitely getting earthquakes uh, a lot more than usual right now, and, and some of them are hitting in the fives and, and 5.5s and things like that. So it's really the people on that side of the island that really need some help right now and some assistance. All right. Thank you for that, Mr. Director of Risk. And also joining us from a land where I don't think they have any earthquake swarms, at least I hope not, New Hampshire, where we are joined by Mr. Matt Amberson, the principal over there at ORATS, a.k.a. Options Research and technology services. Matt, welcome back to the program to you as well. Thanks, Mark. Great to be here. Another decade. Wow. Uh, well, we've been on this show now for a few years, and uh, it's great to be back, Mark. Yeah, you can now say you're entering your second decade of the advisor's option. How crazy does that sound? <laughs> there you go. Put that on your, on your flag, on your wall there in the ORAT's office as we keep on rolling to get the buzz. Busy financial advisors and asset managers don't have time to follow the latest developments from the world of options. So we do it for you. It's time to get the buzz. All right, everybody. Welcome to the buzz. This is the portion of the program where we break down what's going on in the world of derivatives that maybe you missed when you're busy doing your actual day job, which is dealing with your clients and answering their questions and all the other fun things going on there, we also like to give our thoughts on maybe the current volatility environment we find ourselves in. And it's certainly a doozy to kick off the new year and indeed the new decade as we're recording this. It's been a very turbulent first month of the year. Of course, the year kicked off with all of the tensions in the Middle East and the back and forth between the U.S. and Iran. Of course, the trade war still lingered in the background there, even though it seems like phase one at least has perhaps come to some sort of conclusion. And then, of course, now to end the month, we have these pandemic fears that are roiling the markets and indeed roiling most of the globe. See China under massive lockdown and quarantine. We're seeing cases popping up here in the U.S. as well. So this has effectively caused some broad panic sell-offs in the broad markets, and it caused volatility to, shall we say, elevate uh, to levels we haven't seen in some time out here. So a lot of interesting things to weigh in on. Mr. Director of Risk, perhaps we'll start with you, because I was reading just yesterday in a little publication you may be familiar with called USA Today about the pandemic fears and how it's spooking the markets, and they were quoting a wide, wide variety of different people in the article and then one name came across my radar that you, you may be familiar with. I wasn't, Chris, but you may be familiar with this guy, Randy Swan. I'm not sure if you've heard of him. Uh, he said, right now, we're still in the speculative phase with regard to handicapping how much the virus will ultimately impact the global economy or even corporate profits in a travel-linked sector. So Randy, popping up there in USA Today. A lot going on, obviously, in Swan land. So let's start there, Chris. First off, how fun was it to see uh, Randy in that? And then B... I'm just curious, your thoughts, obviously, we're in a somewhat elevated volatility regime here to kick off the new year. How is that impacting what you guys are doing out there with the DRS? And what are your thoughts on where we find ourselves now to to kick off the new year and indeed the new decade? Well, I mean, we discussed a lot about volatility last year and how it's found a floor. So, I mean, one thing that we saw yesterday is um, volatility or the VIX, we'll just keep using that as a proxy, can definitely go from a 12 to 13 up to an 18, 19 very, very quickly. And I think that's the the environment we've been living in the last several years. So uh, you've got to be cognizant about selling premium and at, the, at those types of levels. Um, even though you could be selling puts all day long, the market's rallying, and you're you're making it more from delta, really, than from risk premium. But 
Um, you know, those are the challenges with selling short term volatility that we all have to take. And, and there's also, you know, risk reward trade offs. And, and then actually, the other side is waiting for these types of opportunities to come in and sell more premium or open up at positions at these levels. Um, if you have the patience to wait for these events, uh, you know, we just re hedged our portfolio towards the end of the year. So, you know, we like the levels that we're at right now. And especially after the torrid pace that we've had uh, last year in the B. In you know, this year, which we just show, I mean, we all expected some follow through. And I kind of mentioned, you know, technically we should be testing lower. So we're definitely due for some type of um, pullback. All right, Mr. Matt, same question for you. So I know you're just on our vol program. Funny how the timing works out. But of course, this is an interesting time to be talking about such things like volatility because we are in the midst of, shall we say, an upswing in volatility. Of course, everyone wants to know is it short lived? Is this a new regime? Some of you have been asking that question for a while. Of course, we haven't been asking it in the, in the immediate wake of a potential pandemic as well, which is a bit of uncharted territory for the markets, at least in the, in the near term here. So, Matt, I know you have a lot of models running over there at ORATS. Uh, what are your thoughts on what we're seeing out there right now in, in the current volatility landscape, sir? I think this is real, Mark. I think there's a, a, a regime change from uh, this bullish to now at least mixed, and maybe um, we'll turn a little bit bearish here. Um, we, I look at uh, the contango, not of the VIX, but the contango of the SPY, meaning where are the front month vol- implied volatilities versus the back months. And they're starting to get into backwardation. And when that happens... Those are good signals that there's going to be some volatility ahead. Also, just the, the normal implied volatility, constant maturity at the 30-day has broken out of this channel that we've been in. So that's usually a sign. Uh, some of the technical indicators have turned negative. Uh, so we got a gap down after the, uh, the weekend and, and all the turmoil surrounding the coronavirus. And we've... Uh, We've covered that gap totally. So I think we're covered the gap. And if I'm going to make a call, which I want to do once in a while, I think it's going to turn a little bit negative from here. I think we covered that technical gap, and we're going to uh, test some lows, uh, Mark. Interesting. So you're perhaps buying what the market is selling here. Of course, coming into today's show, we're seeing a little bit of a reversal out there. Most of the major indices back up about 1%. The NASDAQ actually up about 1.5%. So maybe – Erasing some of those near-term uh, sell-off signals we saw yesterday where the sell-off started off pretty hard, over 1%, then kind of mitigated, then it got worse again towards the end of the day, which is never a good sign. Sounds like, Matt, you're, you're, you're a believer here in this. Maybe we're potentially in for a new volatility regime, which would be certainly interesting. We've been lingering in this kind of low teens range for some time, mid to low teens. So perhaps an elevated new regime of volatility would be... Certainly something interesting. And I'd be remiss, Matt, if I didn't ask you before we keep going on with the buzz. This is your season. This is your time of year. We're in it right now. We're hot and heavy. Sometimes it's refreshing to look away from the macro market, which is quite literally scary right now, and sink our teeth into some micro things that we could kind of measure and analyze and look at discreetly, which is, which is kind of nice. So, of course, it's earnings season. Big names are popping off right now. Netflix, Apple, actually, I believe, today. So a lot of big names are popping off. Matt, you guys are the keeper of all of the earnings data over there in the land of ORATS. How are, how are things progressing so far? Any interesting takeaways or surprises you've discovered so far in earnings season, Lancer? Oh, definitely. And as you have pushed me, we have done, we've made a earnings season report now. So we look at the six weeks of earnings uh, announcements and try to see if there's any commonalities, any trends. And we have uh, seen some pretty amazing ones. So it's one of my favorite reports to look at now. Uh, the first two weeks of the earnings season is, is generally not very kind to option owners. Um, you know, those are when more of the stayed companies report. But now when we get into, we're in week three now, when we get into week three and four, that's when the fireworks usually start. For example, uh, you know, the win rate is, is in the low 30s, uh, you know, 30%. So 70% losers, 30% winners in the first two weeks. But then it gets almost to 50% in week four. And then we, we also look at as we... We have a, a method for, for taking the, the expected move out of the straddle price, and we compare that to the actual moves. And that 
tends to indicate how the option owners are doing. Uh, they haven't done real well this season to date, but I'm predicting that, you know, again, once we get through th- the third week and then into the fourth week, that's when uh, I think the uh, the hands will change and, and the option owners will, will do better. So uh, just to uh, talk about the, the this earning season in general, not too much yet, but I think there's more coming. Like you said, we got we have Apple reporting after the after the close. Um, I was on volatility views with you and, and mentioned that the implied straddle was about ten dollars. Now it's up to thirteen dollars. So they heard us, Mark, and um, it's right in line with with the past earnings move of thirteen dollars. So it looks like there's getting more. They're pumping more uh, volatility into these earnings moves. It, it seems like the the market is you know, and that's what tends to happen when we have a when we have a busier, uh, more volatile uh, week. We were seeing uh, we're seeing the implied earnings move get up closer to the the past earnings move. So um, yeah, this is going to be there's going to be some fireworks in the next couple of weeks, Mark. That's what I'm predicting. You guys let the cat out of the bag on Vol Views. You know, you talked about how, uh, how what a great deal Apple Vol was, and they clearly heard us, sir. Now it's all bid up. So that's just the lesson I've learned over time. You got to put those trades on before you talk before you talk about them on the shows, because once it's out there, sir, uh, that's it. Cats are front run in Vol Views. <laughs> there we go. Uh, but a lot has been popping off since the last time we've gathered here together on the show in the world of. All things derivatives, including a pretty interesting one. You know, we've touched on crypto before. People have asked us about it, but it's never really been uh, a sector that a lot of the RIAs and asset managers in our audience really could play with for a variety of reasons that most of you know, of course, regulatory issues. Most of these products not really approved here in the U.S. You have to tunnel through the VPN to get access to them. It's not really an environment that a registered asset manager really needs to or can even play with. But clearly, there's demand for this space on the part of clients. And I've heard from more than a few people over the course of the past couple of weeks, ever since CME finally got into the fray with their new Bitcoin options. It only took them two years to launch these things. <laughs> a lot of advisors have reached out to us and said, hey, you know, this is kind of opening the floodgates for me. I can finally get into these products. My clients have been asking me and asking me and asking me. And I kept telling them I couldn't really do anything with these, but now we have a lit, listed, regulated venue that is offering not just futures, but the options on the futures. It's a big turning point for a lot of the advisors out there, which kind of interests me because I hadn't really thought of it in those terms before. So clearly, this is something that resonates uh, for this audience as well. Of course, let's dial it back a little bit. I'm getting ahead of myself in my excitement. Of course, CME launching their Bitcoin options back on January 13th after delaying and talking about it and me poking and prodding them for pretty much two years. When are you going to launch the options? They finally did on January 13th. And it was a bit of a, shall we say, a rough launch. Uh, throughout the day, they were putting out, looked like there was no volume on them. People kept hitting us up all day. Like, What's going on with the volume? No volume, no volume. Well, there was some volume. We knew it had to be some sort of uh, hiccup there with the data. There was some volume, not quite a ton. The day before, the futures had done nearly 14,000 contracts. Everyone expected the options to kind of come out of the gate on fire. They kind of came out of the gate more with a, a dull whimper, we're about 54 contracts uh, going up. And we've seen similar paper going up uh, ever since then. So they haven't really been lighting it up on fire. By the way, our friends over there at QuickStrike have created a cool new Quick Crypto, which allows you, if you're interested in such things, and you're looking at what, want to see what's trading and the volume and the skew, it's a good place to go. And they sent over some data to us, which was interesting and a little puzzling that a lot of the paper going up out there has been, shall we say, bizarre, deep, deep, Deep in the money contracts. In fact, uh, we're seeing 60,000, 65,000, and 70,000 strike puts trading out there, which are obviously 50 to 60,000 handles in the money. It's not a, not a usual type of trade. Clearly, there's some parity plays and some, some carry plays going on out there. It's also why I have a problem with quoting things in Notional, which is what the crypto market loves to do all the time, because these are obviously deep, meaty contracts that really represent not a lot in terms of actual contract volume. So it's interesting what's going on out there. But for, I think for this audience, it is kind of fascinating. And it may open the doors to some new products. As of right now, there are about 272 contracts open over there in CME land. It looks like about 25 contracts trading so far today. So not exactly lighting the world on fire, but it's the start. And hopefully this is 
judging by what you guys have sent into us, this is maybe the beginning of uh, some access to some new products. Chris, I know in the past you got you haven't been as up on the whole crypto wave, but clearly there's client demand in the advisor space for this. So what are your thoughts on finally CME getting their act together and launching the options here? And do you think this is potentially a, a starting point for a lot of players in this audience to potentially dip their toes into the crypto waters? Well, like you said, it's a start. I mean, you're not going to expect uh, with a product like this where there's a lot of, there's probably more questions and answers um, with this product. So, you know, going from futures and then listing options, it's going to take some time. And I think people, it's just like in equity products. When you list a new index, you can't expect volume to just um, all of a sudden, you know, come out of the gates, you know, like SPX style. So it's going to take some time. I think it's a good thing that they were listed. I think people are going to be watching it and just seeing how they play out and kind of seeing, you know, well, you know, when we listed futures, you know, the price of spot kind of changed. Now options are out there, and I think you know what would be prudent is just kind of watch for a little bit and then see how is that going to really affect you know how the underlying moves and trades. Matt, I know you've been watching the crypto space for a while. Did this excite you as well to see CME finally getting in the the listed options game? And is this also maybe intriguing for you on the data side? There's a lot of data to parse and to analyze here about what's going up out here, what's going on with the vol and the skew. A lot of uh, interesting things. So, is this interest you on that level as well, sir? Yeah, we we've talked about this for uh, now a couple of years, Mark, and it, and it's interesting to see, you know, the the skews look about like what we thought, you know, skewed towards the upside. Uh, Bitcoin gets more uh, volatile as it moves up, like gold, um, and you know, right around the levels, you know, mid seventy levels, it looks like. So that that was what we expected. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's another product, um, and. You know, I, I'm. It's 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 hard for me to get. Uh, you know, I have those ambivalent feelings about Bitcoin. Uh, you know, I, I I've heard of it for so many years and got into it kind of early, but you know, obviously not in the size that I wish I would have. But um, it, it's just, uh, you know, I think it remains to be seen how it's going to play out. And uh, I'm bullish on on Bitcoin long term. Um, surprisingly, but, um, you know, I, I think as a trading instrument, I, you know, it, it reminds me of spikes, you know, it's just going to take a while for, for it to, to catch on. Um, but you know, I'm excited that it's here, Mark. Yeah. It seems like forever ago that you and I were on that Bitcoin derivatives panel with the high level folks over there at CME. That was over a year ago now. It's crazy. And I asked them that question then. I said, are you going to list the options? And they kind of said, nah, we're looking more at, I think at the time they said they're looking more at ether futures rather than the options. So a year and change later, they finally got their act together and they listed the options. It's a slow start, but it's a start. And I said before, there needs to be some sort of resonance for one of these products somewhere in the space, whether it's CME, whether it's ICE, whatever it is. One of these listed lit venues has to succeed for crypto and particularly the crypto derivatives to really kind of take that next step and become that big boy market that the audience for a show like this can play in. They want to do size when they come, and they want to be able to execute it cleanly, not have any counterparty risks, not have any regulatory risks. So one of these needs to, uh, needs to take off for that to happen. But it's an interesting, interesting start to that journey. Speaking of journeys, another journey coming to an end. We talked about it before a number of times. It's been a little while, uh, you, a lot, mostly on the volatility show, a little bit on this show as well. You know, the myriad lawsuits – that, are swir- that have swirled around the VIX. You know, we were just talking about VIX at the top of the show. VIX has kind of become kind of the Kleenex for the volatility space. And, of course, post-February 2018, VIX, Mageddon, volatility apocalypse, call it what you will, there were a number of lawsuits swirling around VIX, alleging a number of different things. I think one of the silliest I always thought was the allegations of manipulation behind the scenes by senior SIBO executives that, they, hey, they were sitting there laughing in the basement maniacally as they were pulling levers and manipulating VIX. That always seemed kind of ridiculous to me. seems like a judge finally agreed with that part, dismissing the last part of the lawsuit over the quote-unquote fear gauge. Uh, he said a 48-page decision, so the guy didn't, uh, didn't mince words. He made some interesting comments here. He says that he thinks the more compelling inference here is that SIBO pursued a profit moding, motive excuse me, by making the VIX replicable, thereby helping liquidity providers offset risk, which is, you, of course, have to do. You have to be able to do synthetics and everything else uh, to offset your risk. Otherwise, it's an unhedgeable product. Uh, he goes on to say, and any manipulation that occurred was unintentional or negligent from SIBO's perspective. He also dismissed a class action 
last May, and he dismissed this suit with prejudice, so they can't refile this. And so, yeah, he said the notion of, you know, SIBO was actively manipulating this and attended to defraud investors by letting, quote, John Doe traders manipulate options and futures tied to the sphere gauge known as the VIX uh, to generate higher transaction fees that was, in his words, uh, not, he found no proof of that. So interesting stuff here. This was one of the more salacious allegations. Of course, there was this quote-unquote whistleblower who was quoted in the journal that they had this quote-unquote proof of this sort of manipulation. And everyone wanted to say, okay, show us the proof. And it never, sounds like never materialized uh, for the judge either. And this is something we kind of talked about on the show, but it's been a while since we haven't had any developments in the lawsuit till just now. So it sounds like this is behind us, Chris. We can all go back to talking about VIX without having to worry about, about these types of allegations. I think there are still questions around some of the things people have alleged in the past about carpet bombing and things, which aren't really in this lawsuit. But the notion that you know they were there behind the scenes manipulating the VIX to defraud people, it seems like that's behind us, Mr. Director of Risk. Yeah, the, the key here is intent to defraud. I don't think any exchange lists a product with the intent to defraud anybody. I mean, are all products perfect? Probably not. There, there's always tweaks. I mean, there's all kinds of financial products out there that can can use a tweak here and there. But um, you know, I think the judge got it right. There's no intent to defraud, to defraud here. And, and the VIX, again, you know, some people like it, some people hate it. But regardless, it's something that we talk about more than anything else. Just about more than any other equity product or index out there. So, um, yeah, hopefully we can move on and then start using it uh, as the tool that it was intended to be. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see. They can actually get out there and start talking about VIX again. It was kind of hard for them to talk about their marquee product when they were being sued about it all the time. So that'll be interesting as well. What also is interesting is what you guys have on your brains because you inspire us in many different ways. So without further ado, let's head on into our next segment. It's time to talk about the tricks of the trade. And now it's time for practical advice on the best tools, tips, and techniques for implementing options into your practice. It's time to learn the tricks of the trade. All right, welcome to the tricks of the trade, where we break down some of the interesting ways you can utilize these products and how pros like to use them. And this next segment was, as are many segments on this show, inspired by you guys. This one coming from Telner, Telner6. He, he asked, what are the three strategies that you feel each advisor should have in his back pocket for when clients ask about options? And this was, I thought, an interesting question. It opens up the floodgates to many different ways you could potentially go with this. You could go for the income side, which, spoiler alert, I think a lot of advisors do. Uh, you can go for the speculation side if they think, hey, I like stock X. How can I use options to speculate on this stock rallying or whatever the case may be? Maybe right now, let's say they're concerned about pandemic fears. They want to hedge. You can go that way. There are many other ways you can go. So there are a lot. I have my thoughts on this, but I don't want to, I don't want to color the narrative. So I'm going to let you guys go first. Let's start. Let's go the other way. Let's go with the, uh, the keeper of all the earnings data first, Mr. Matt Sir, if Someone comes to you like, let's say, Mr. or Mrs. Telner Six. And they ask you, what do you think? Or he, I like that he picks three. You can pick any number. Let's just keep it at three because it's a kind of fun round number. What do you think are the three strategies each advisor should have in his back pocket, sir, for when clients are asking about them, their options? Yeah, I mean, a good question. And uh, I'm not going to. I'm not going to surprise anyone here uh, with the first two, but maybe with the third. So, um, you know, a. a Way out of the money covered call. I mean, if, if uh, someone's coming to you asking for uh, a strategy, I think you want to ha- have them be as successful as possible uh, and work within the expectations. I think people should sell calls that are farther out of the money, um, and you, so you won't get called away, especially in a bull, in a in a bull market like we've been in. So, uh, and of course, we do a lot of back testing on this, and we've. We uh, could show that the, you know, at least, of course, in this this bull market, that it's uh, the more out of the money ones have worked better. But you know, even when the market's uh, sideways, um, you know, I think a good strategy is is especially with um, you know being an advisor, you don't want to get called away. Um, you know, often that, that is a traumatic experience. Uh, so, out of the way, out of the money, uh, call selling. Uh, secondly, uh, lo- very long term puts. Um, you know, in a lot of our testing, 
uh, you know, you get the long term puts and you get them out of the money too. So you, you know, it ends up um, it ends up not costing all that much, and you still have some uh, some protection out there. Uh, so that's you know that, that's definitely one to you know, fig- figure out a, a put level that the the client can be can be comfortable with, and then for an income producing, I like the uh, one by two, buy one sell two for you know a bit of a credit, not a huge credit. So then you have a little bit of room where you own the put. I do a put one by two, and then the problem is is then you're uh, short units is what we call it. You, you have one long uh, closer to the money, so if it goes down a little bit, you've made that money, and then you. But then you're short too. So if it goes past the strike a ways, then you start to lose money, and so. Uh, and but you've done it for, for a credit. So if the stock goes up, then you've you've collected that credit. But if you do that in, in combination with one of those long term puts. Then those the long term puts start to kick in as it goes down. So that's what I'd like to do. Um, and also we're doing some testing now with a um, with a strategy that you know it's more of a, a, a calendar where you're long to uh, shorter term puts and a short one just a little bit longer term. Uh, that's kind of an interesting. one. Interesting. Yeah, you did surprise me with that. Put one by two. I didn't. I didn't expect that. Well, that's kind of why I wanted to see what you guys. I had a feeling one or two of you might might surprise me with something because there are obviously some standard answers, and I have those in, in the back pocket, and I'm, I'm thinking about those. But I, I figured you guys might have a surprise or two in store for our audience. Put one by twos. Didn't think you were going there. Interesting, Mister Director of Risk. Same question for you. What are the three strategies? Maybe perhaps you have a surprise lurking out there. Ratio iron condor swaps. What do you think about that? Uh, didn't we talk about that in the previous show here? So, yeah, Matt kind of stole the main ones here. Um, I think if you're a little bit more aggressive on the income side and there's another popular strategy out there, just cash secured puts, I think, for advisors, you know, for levels where people want to own certain stocks. I mean, that's that's been a, a decent trade over the last few years in this bull market. Um, as far as hedging is concerned, I think you need to decide whether you want to be a tactical hedger or a long-term hedger for bear market type situations. So that's going to be the difference between you know put spreads if you want to be tactical and just hedge out shorter term type 5 and 10% corrections. Or do you do longer dated type puts where you're, more, you're worried more about you know 20% down type markets, more bear market type uh, uh, scenarios. Um, I'm not going to give up. It's funny you mentioned the iron condor. I'm not going to give up on the iron condor or butterflies, but I think you need to use them tactically. Uh, I think the days, or at least the last 10 years or so, the days of putting on the standard at the money butterfly, at the money condor has had a rough go. But I think you can do them tactically. For instance, yesterday when the market was down 50 handles, you know, why not put some upside call flies, upside uh, call condors for the bounce back? So that's what I mean when, when using kind of it's kind of quasi speculative income, if you will. But, um, you know, we've had much more success being tactical about those types of strategies as opposed to being systematic and just putting them on at the money every single month. Yeah, you know, there's, there's so many different ways you can go. That, like you mentioned, the tactical element. That, that's one of the things that keeps me away from recommending stuff like that, even though it is fun and interesting and, you know, the iron flies. And I was obviously joking about the ratio iron condor swaps listeners, but it's, it's a way you could go if you were so inclined. But one of the frequent complaints we hear from advisors, we hear a couple of them, obviously. First is they don't know about options, not like that comfortable with their knowledge of options, hence a show like this to help arm you with more information like that. And B, the other complaint we hear is, is time, right? Time management. They don't have the time to sit there and babysit some of the more esoteric positions that require a little bit of handholding, like the aforementioned iron condor swaps and things like that, where you have to be, as Chris said, tactical. You have to be engaged. You have to be watching it all the time. And that's a challenge for a lot of advisors who have a lot of assets to manage, a lot of client accounts to manage. That's one of the more common refrains we hear on that front. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to gauge my response along those Limitations, and you guys hit on I think the main one, the go-to, the the one every advisor has to have when someone knocks on their door says I want to use options. I wouldn't say ninety-nine percent, but a large majority of advisors utilize this one strategy and kind of this one only. Really, it's the covered call. You have to have it in your back pocket. I think Matt made a good caveat about the far out of the money. Obviously, that's going to mitigate how much income 
you're generating from this, but the other complaint we hear from advisors is I can't have my underlying called away for a variety of reasons. Maybe it's taxes. Maybe they just don't want to deal with the hassle. Either way, they get freaked out when their underlying is called away. So it's going to mitigate some of the income you could bring in. You have to go farther out, but I think Matt's on the money with that. You need to have a little bit of wiggle room. Also, he's the back tester guy. He knows that a lot of the gains from the covered call position comes from still having the underlying and getting that appreciation. So you want to give yourself a little bit of room to run. At the end of the day, you own the stock for a reason. Give it some, give it some breathing room. Give it some room to run. So I think I can get on board with the far out of the money covered call, but you have to have a covered call. In your arsenal, otherwise you're just you're not. That's table stakes in the advisor world uh, these days. The other side of which kind of interesting. I think Chris mentioned another one that I kind of toy with. Cause income always seems to be just kind of the number one interest concern. Call it what you will for a lot of the advisors out there. So I think that cash secured put is another one. It's kind of the other side of the coin of the covered call, which is why I don't hesitate to recommend it because if you understand the risks of one, you should theoretically be able to wrap your head around the risks of the other. They are equivalent. At the end of the day, I say cash secured. I think we have a listener question about this a little bit later, so I don't get too much into it now. But it, most of the of the accounts out there, a lot of them are retirement accounts, so you're going to need to do the cash secured version. Naked put selling a no-no in a lot of retirement accounts. And as long as you understand the risk associated with that, you identified a level in which you like to buy the stock, you're going to buy it anyway. If you, Instead of working a limit buy order in the underlying, I'd much rather see advisors use the cash secured put as a way to get into it. If they don't get filled, they get some income out of it. They've set aside the capital to buy it anyway, so they've done their due diligence. Again, just don't get carried away with it, writing puts like a madman. We all know how crazy that can go. But if you've identified a level where you're comfortable buying the stock, then I think you're okay with it. And then the other, the third one is kind of a bit of a hybrid position because uh, protection, Matt touched on the protection and the, int- the, the need for it, and that's certainly something – that a lot of advisors out here may be hearing from their clients right now, but they also hear the other complaint that people don't want to pay for it. People do not want to pay for protection. So that becomes a challenge. (laughs) And so that's why I've often said in the past there, really one of the holy grail positions for advisors, particularly in an environment like this, a little bit of elevated vol, a little bit of concern about some downside in the broad equities out there. That's where the collar really comes into play. You can pick your poison. I don't like zero cost collars, even though they are attractive for a certain, I know for this audience in particular, because you can kind of set them and forget them. You have reg- relatively nominal outlay, keep it all in the same month. You, month expires, you move on, you do it again. I understand why you have to do it that way. If you're going to construct a collar optimally, OIC has a lot of great data on how to do that. They've come down on roughly a six month put and about every month writing that call. It requires a little bit more effort, but it's going to maximize the time decay on both ends of the spectrum and make your collar perform much better as a result. But to set it and forget it, one month at a time, zero-cost collar, I can also understand that being an interesting one for this audience as well. We can go on for hours with a lot of this stuff. It's a great question. Thanks for that, Telner, because you inspired a, a great segment. So just to wrap up here, recap, for me it was the covered call, it was the cash secured put, and then kind of a bit of a hybrid position, the collar, which is, of course, the protective put and the covered call combined into one. Chris had the covered call as well, as well as uh, a funky tactical flies, I believe he called them. If if you're savvy enough and understand enough how to do those, that's an interesting way to go about, as well as he also mentioned the cash secured puts. And Matt went for the caveat of the far out of the money covered calls, which I think is an interesting one. And then he mentioned some ways to maybe get that protective put for a little bit less. And then the old put one by two, which I think was a fun curveball. Uh, for all of us. But you guys have a ton of questions. I want to make sure we get more of you on. So without further ado, let's keep on rolling into your office hours. It's time to answer your pressing questions about options. It's time to start our office hours. You can become a part of this segment by leaving a question on the optionsinsider.com, emailing us at questions at the optionsinsider.com, or via social media at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, or stocktwits.com slash options insider. All right, everybody, welcome to The Office Hours. This is where we hang out the shingle, and you guys get to ask us whatever's on your brains. You also get to send in some love, like our first listener did, Nettles. I like the handle, Nettles. Nettles just says, thanks for the show. Love it. 
Well, you're welcome, Nettles. And we love you guys. We love all you guys who listen, who tune in, who send in questions. Keep the show rolling. You guys are the reason we do this. So that love right back at you, Mr. or indeed Mrs. Nettles. All right, let's go on here. Next up, Ed. Ed Martin says, I enjoy allocating approximately 10% of my clients' portfolios to precious metals, particularly gold. I find it to be a useful diversification tool for long equity portfolios. You've recommended using short puts as an entry tool for equities in the past. Can this same strategy be utilized in a commodity ETF like GLD? Are there any caveats or pitfalls I should watch out for? And would I be better off writing the options on the futures instead? Oh, a lot to unpack there. Uh, Chris, you were just talking about cash-secured puts, so it might be a good starting point here. Ed wants to do a little bit of a different flavor of them. He wants to do them instead of like an Apple or a Spy. He wants to do them in GLD. What are your thoughts on that particular strategy in an ETF that tracks a commodity like GLD and then maybe per- versus doing that on, on the futures option set? Do you have a preference there, sir? Uh, yeah, I, I think it is useful. I mean, anytime you're going to add a, an asset to your overall portfolio that is not correlated with the rest, you can add value, like hedging. Like if you're hedging uh, an equity portfolio with puts, that is that is not a correlated asset, right? It moves in the opposite direction. So um, I, I think with a product like any commodity, you have to be a, a little bit more aware of uh, more macro issues if you want to go back to 2013. And let's just t- stick with GLD, the ETF, gold ETF. And if you sold the 140 put back in 2013 and got assigned, well, you've been sitting on that ETF for seven years now and you finally have been able to get out. So, you know, commodities have a little bit more of a twist. Uh, they're going to be subject to what's going on a lot more with uh, supply and demand, et cetera. And, and all these other different factors. So it's something I, I, I think with commodities that it's a little bit more technical analysis is needed and also um, really be aware of more macro issues that could affect supply and demand factors for commodities, whatever commodity you might be trading. And as far as doing it, uh, options on the futures, I mean, I always, you know, anytime you're writing options on futures, the first thing people start asking, well, why are you doing it? Is it because of leverage? I think if you want to be levered or be able to do more with less, then you can always uh, consider writing options on futures. But other than that, I would, I would stick to equity products um, and keep it more simple, especially if you're an advisor for clients. I mean, clients have to be comfortable with what you're doing, and I think that's the number one thing for getting anything done with a client, especially a client that's just getting into options. And you're okay with the general use case of just writing a put to get long GLD. You think that that same strategy can be applied that you use in Apple and Spy. You can take that same thing and apply it in GLD. That doesn't concern you at all. Well, sure. I mean, you, I, you, I could get the example on on an equity where you wanted to own it at some price, and then all of a sudden, a couple of years ago, you could have gotten it 50% cheaper. So I think, again, you have to uh, analyze more supply and demand factors with commodities. Um, you certainly don't want to get stuck in any type of trade for too long. I mean, there was a, a point in time where you could sell oil puts all day long, and then all of a sudden, oil crashed, and you owned oil for a very, very long time. And it takes years. I mean, maybe the equities over the last 10 or so years, I mean, buying the dip has been a very good strategy. I and mean, we can't can't deny that since 2010, 2011-ish. But with commodities, buying the dip isn't necessarily um, or has not been as strong. And again, it depends on the commodity like the equities have over the last 10 years. So I think it's there could be some more challenges with commodities versus equities. Um, but the basic strategy can definitely be used if it fits you know, with your overall goal. Matt, same question for you. What do you have to say here for Mr. Martin who wants to use some short puts to maybe get into GLD and maybe some thoughts comparing and contrasting doing it on GLD versus the the COMEX gold futures option, sir? Yeah, you know I like my uh, precious metals, Mark. So, uh, But I think what you have to be careful of with the puts, uh, selling puts in in GLD is one, the level of – implied volatility is low and also the skew is is not in your favor so the what happens when uh, gold moves is it moves more volatilely on the upside than the downside so the market is skewed that way meaning that the implied volatility skews are higher often in the calls than the puts so you have kind of a double whammy against you so the the shorting of puts um, if you go look at the puts, I actually think they're quite cheap. So I, I would rather, you know, maybe own the stock and own the puts, or own a call in the money call um, is the way that I would play it. And I think what tends to happen I, with the, the the futures options, with the regular options, is they'll 
they'll uh, you know they're, you're not going to find uh, a whole lot of opportunity because people are arbitraging that generally. So uh, wh- whatever one uh, you're, you're trading and, or your client wants to trade, I think um, is fine on that mark. Yeah, you know I think you guys all all raise good points. The skew and the volatility certainly things to be aware of. We, we've talked on our Twifo show many times over the course of the past year how gold volatility has kind of been in the doldrums for many years now. We've had a few moments of a little bit of activity over the course of the past six months or so. But outside of those, selling volatility in gold has kind of been a bit of a fool's errand. So I'm with, I'm with Matt on that. In terms of the broad strategy, the efficacy of it is the same. Selling a put on that, you can use that same strategy. You shouldn't have any concerns there. Usually I would prefer to see people go directly to the underlying. A lot of the ETPs out there that attempt to replicate an underlying do a pretty poor job of it. I'm looking at things like VXX trying to replicate a VIX future or USO trying to replicate crude oil. They all do a terrible job of it, and they have roll yield impacts and issues as a result. I, so I would usually recommend, hey, go to the source. Go to the future or the futures option if that's your area. But GLD and, and SLV, though they hold the physicals. So I don't have those concerns as well. So I think you'd be okay writing writing puts in those, particularly if you only have securities account. You don't want to get cleared for Futures. That, that, no, that's a big hurdle for a lot of advisors and their clients. They don't want to deal with futures, if, if at all possible. So I think you'd be okay there, GLD. And indeed, you didn't ask SLB, but it's in the same family there. It's similar. They hold the physical as well. Good question there, Mr. Ed. Let's see if AJ here can keep up. AJ Hernandez wants to know. He says, ESG is all the rage in the investing world right now. Has this had any spillover into options yet? And can I buy ESG options? Well, a lot to unpack there. You know, it's funny. AJ, you should mention this because I just had someone ask me something similar not too long ago, about a week or two ago. ESG, which of course stands for environmental, social, and governance uh, type issues. It's a, whole, it's a hot new area in corporate responsibility and corporate boards and a lot of consultants. It was a consultant who asked me about it. A lot of consultants are, are making a lot of money coming up with ESG scores or different companies now. So it's a hot thing on that side of the fence. We haven't seen it spill over – too directly yet into the options world. Uh, that said, there are starting to be some funds that, that have this as kind of their driving mission. Uh, so that's an area you could explore. And that's certainly, I, I mean, there's different ways to grade these things, obviously, right? So if you have some criteria you like to use, you could certainly scan for names that, that rank highly on your criteria and then trade options on them. So in that sense, you could buy an option on a stock that has a high ESG score in your point of view. And, you know, they might be off the look. While I toss to you guys, I'll have to look. There probably is some like MSCI or someone probably has an, an ESG index probably as well. If there's, if there's a product interest, they're going to list it. They're not going to sit around on it. Whether that's optionable or not is another question. So um, let's go around the horn. Let's go the same way we came. Chris, so this has got to be something you're hearing a lot from uh, asset managers out there now. It's kind of the hot new trend. In the in the investing world, you got to be got to be high on ESG. Is this something you're hearing about uh, from advisors as you're talking to them, maybe at the tenth box stuff? And do you have any thoughts for AJ who wants to buy ESG options? Uh, personally, we have not been hearing that much about it, so it's not um, our wheel well right now. But obviously, if it gains more more traction, we'll definitely start looking at it. But um, I, I think again, an option on any product is a good thing, right? Whether to Create income or hedge, and if it fits for the ESG products, then by all means. I'm just looking here while we're talking about uh, yeah, MSCI. They're the home of a lot of different index product listeners. They have a bunch of what they call ESG indexes, so they screen them by a variety of different categories and characteristics. ESG leaders indexes, ESG focus indexes. There's a bunch of them, ESG universal, all kinds of indices here. So check these out. Maybe one of these meets your criteria. I don't know... I'm going to guess most of these are probably not optionable, so that may be your issue there. But the underlyings exist, and if there's interest on this going forward, then we could talk about that. Matt, anything on ESG? Is this something you're hearing from people coming to ORATS more these days? Yeah, we're not hearing a whole lot about it, but um, the in, in their, as, as far as options go, uh, you know, there are some ETFs out there, but they trade very very low amounts of uh, of options. So, uh, unfortunately, there's not much to do in the options game in in the in this sector, Mark. 
Yeah, it's not quite there yet. It does seem like it's very much still in kind of the early nascent phases out there. The consultants love it because they get to sell their ESG scores and uh, some of the other broad investors because it makes them look concerned and looks like they're doing the corporately responsible thing. Uh, <laughs> uh, so uh, interesting, interesting stuff out there. But yeah, not a lot on the quote unquote ESG options outside of the you roll your own, go do it yourself find these names and, and trade options on them. Uh, Constantine. Constantine has a question, kind of related to something we talked about a few shows ago when we looked at, I believe it was the Morningstar and indeed the Calamos analysis of the Morningstar data, talking about how there are just not many options-based funds out there still. He wants to know, why are there so few options-based fund managers out there today? Well, Chris, as our duly appointed representative of an options-based fund manager yourself, indeed the director of risk for one, uh, we have to say to, to the uh, the well named Constantine here. Why are there so few of you, sir? Well, we may be a few, but we're growing. Um, you know, it depends on what's the latest trade. To be honest, we're in a bull market, and people want to sell puts. And and like Matt has been recommending here, is is deep out of the money covered calls. Um, and I I think we just haven't had a bear market in such a long time. Uh, people have forgotten what that feels like. Um, you know, we've got a piece on our website called Math Matters where, you know, over a full market cycle, it really depends on what you're capturing to the upside versus what you're not losing on the downside. And that's really what builds wealth here. So um, it's just a sign of the times where a lot of people who have gotten into, you know, into options over the last five, 10 years, they we, we hear people saying, well, I'm never going to buy a put ever again. Why do I need to? I mean, the Fed put is so strong, but something will happen in the marketplace. There will be something that kicks off. Um, that changes the environment and, and you, people will scramble to hedge at the same time. And you see it to some degree on a very small level with the VIX when it pops from a 12 to an 18 in one day. I mean, those are huge moves in the VIX. And I'm not saying, again, that's, that's bear market type protection that people are running out to in the short term space, you know, and when the term structure flips you know, to backwardation. But again, we just have not seen um, a large enough of event or a structural event to change the economy. We have not had a recession in some quite to, in some time, yet alone a, a full blown bear market. So, um, yeah, there are a few of us out there, but we're out there, and it really depends on you know what a client wants um, and whether they want to s- sleep well at night or not. Well said, sir. Matt, anything to add there on why there's still such a dearth of options-based managers out there? Yeah, that's hard. That's a hard one. Um, we uh, are getting more and more activity from uh, advisors coming to us. So it, it's you know, to me, it seems like there, it, it's a growing part, and as what Chris says. So, but I'm not sure why there aren't more. You know, probably because you know, what, what have you need to done in this in this bull market? Just buy stocks. <laughs> um, but you know, there will be a time. And I know that I use it for my personal accounts, options that, I, that is, you know, to, as Chris says, to sleep better at night. So, you know, there isn't there. Uh, we're seeing more, uh, more and more uh, interest in from advisors. So, you know, hopefully that that uh, will translate to having more funds in the future, Mark. Yeah, you know, this has kind of been a common refrain. It's one of the reasons why we launched this show many years ago, because there, we saw that there was just a dearth of players in this space, and there continues to be. There are more. I think one of the things Calamos pointed out, maybe a little bit alarming in that data, was of, of the, I forgot how many there were, I think 80-odd uh, options-based funds on the Morningstar tracking the vast majority of them were launched in the last couple of years, so very short track record. So as Chris mentioned, there are more coming. That pace is accelerating. Maybe this show, it can take some small credit in some way for some of that. So the options, the options gospel is getting out there. Of course, Eric and his team doing a lot of outreach. Chris and the team over there at Swan doing a lot of the 10th box stuff. Matt sitting down with the advisors in between episodes of this show like this and, and explaining them their options to them. All of that is collectively starting to raise, raise the tide out there, but the products, as you've seen, they're they're still intimidating to a lot of people, and that's a that's a barrier to entry. The lack of education, most of the big, you know, uh, tests out there, the seven sixty three, everything else, the CFA, they don't really touch on options very often, so or in any great details. So people don't take those exams and come out feeling qualified to talk about options. One of the issues that Eric and his team at OIC are trying to overcome and have been trying for years is to try to create some sort of certification for options. The industry still a little scared post Madoff to certify people, which is why it hasn't happened. But that's something I think would that would also go a long way towards really helping this. If you go out there and start certifying the next generation of fund managers and advisors as, hey, you understand these things on this level, that will certainly, I think, boost their confidence 
about uh, about using these products going forward. All right, we've got we've got time for let's do one more quick one here before we wrap. I like to I could squeeze I could do hundreds of you guys on the show here. We love that you guys uh, sent in so many great questions. Let's go to this lap it up on this one here from Angelo. A nice quick one. Angelo wants to know. He said I can trade covered calls in my clients' retirement accounts. Can I also trade cash secured puts? To initiate long equity positions, this is a common refrain. Matt and Chris here, people, a lot of the advisors out there in our audience, a lot of their clients, their assets are in retirement accounts. So that limits them in terms of what they can do from an options perspective. Chris, I know you mentioned earlier you were very careful to say cash-secured puts in your recommendations uh, out there. So what do you have to say here for our friend Angelo? Can he do those in his clients' IRA accounts? Uh, yes, you can do them in the IRA accounts, but I always tell people when you're looking into trading options on your IRA account, please, please make sure you have a conversation with the custodian and the broker. Um, sometimes they'll change the different basic levels between what you can and cannot do. So um, for the most part, yes, you can, but please confirm where your account is. Well said, sir. And unfortunately, listeners... That music means we've come to the end of another epic journey through the world of advisors and options. Amazing how fast time flies when you're talking advisors and options. Touched on a lot of great fun stuff, some scary stuff on the show as well, of course. Pandemics and perhaps their impact on the volatility regime. Matt thinking maybe we're headed for a new volatility regime, which is kind of interesting. Of course, we talked about the launch of the new uh, Bitcoin options over there, maybe a point of entry. For a lot of you advisors whose clients are chomping at the bit to get into that space, a listed, lit, regulated venue may be an interesting point of entry for you guys. Talked about the three strategies all of us think you as an advisor should really have in your back pocket for when your clients come knocking about options. A little bit of differing opinion on us, but mostly I think we all came down around the same, the same neighborhoods, the same areas when it comes to the use cases. So let us know your thoughts on that. Of course, we answered, as we always like to do, a bunch of your questions about cash secured puts, about SKU and commodities, about ESG, about all sorts of fun stuff. So keep those questions, those comments coming. Before we go, let's go back around the horn, check in with each of my cohorts, my partners in crime here, see what they have cooking. That may interest you until the next time we all gather here together. Let's start with you, Mr. Matt. If folks are intrigued, maybe they want to check out the earnings reports, maybe they want to do some back testing, maybe they want to reach out to you about your own uh, RIA out over there. Where should they go? What should they do? Yeah, you can email me, Matt, M-A-T-T, at orats.com, or just go to orats.com. A lot of fun stuff that we're working on. We've had some artificial intelligent uh, machine learning firms come and and work with our data, and they're showing some very promising results, so we're excited about that. Uh, We also have a graph. Um, I looked at the gold skew, and it hasn't always been like this um, it's been uh, with our indicators graph you could see the skew all the way back to 2007 so that's uh, we've been working on that we're going to release that soon as well so a lot of a lot of fun things over at orets.com mark there you go check it out yes i think it was ed who asked that question about gold skew if you're interested in such things ed head on over to orets.com kick the tires and look at this chart right now and one of the things that's fun about the commodities is that their skew evolves over time. So it's not just like SPY or SPX or the other products people have come to know and love where the puts are bid and the calls are offered and we have come to expect that. It's like clockwork. The slope may change, but the nature of the skew really doesn't. In the commodities, it's a different game. And now we're seeing gold a little bit bid, so the bids to the calls. If people are concerned about gold, it's going to be bid to the puts. And that evolving nature of the skew makes it interesting and maybe a little bit more attractive at times to trade. So... Check out that history and check out all the other stuff. Matt's always talking about orats.com. O-R-A-T-S dot com is the place to go. Kick the tires over there on the Twitters as well. Give them a follow at Option Rats. It's a memorable handle. They put out some cool data in between episodes of the show there as well. Mr. Director of Risk, same question for you. I'm seeing a lot of cool stuff going on in the land of Swan these days. Of course, you have your 10th box, but I see you know, Mark Odo's doing some classes over there. Now you have a Brandy's popping up in USA Today. You guys are all over the place. What is cooking in the land of Swan these days, sir? 
Yeah, our latest piece on our website is uh, Breaking Domestic Investing Bias with Emerging Markets that highlights potential opportunities in emerging markets with respect to equity valuations. Um, and exactly what you just said, Mark Oda put out a 10-part series that's called All Options on the Table, um, and that's geared towards advisors. And not only talks about option-based strategies, but um, you know discusses due, li- due diligence, which is very important nowadays, and portfolio implementation. Yeah, you guys are really committed to the cause over there, going out there and arming advisors with options information. You even have a class out there now. So check it out if you want to learn more, listeners. Swan Global Investments is the place. That just shows the commitment to growing this space. You know, Even firms like Swan, they want to go out and create new competitors for themselves because it's good for everyone at the end of the day to, as our listener asked for, have more options-based funds and more advisors out there who actually understand the space is good for everyone at the end of the day so we all just don't ride the market up and then ride it right back down again and of course our friend mr cott he's out traveling yet again burning up that shoe leather couldn't join us today check him out over there optionseducation.org. click on the financial advisor tab there on the bottom corner of the home page to get all the good data and studies they're always cranking out over there in the land of oic and on behalf of matt and chris and mr eric who's out there somewhere and indeed myself I want to thank all of you out there for downloading, streaming, subscribing, for sending in so many great and varied questions. Keep those coming. We love them. And we'll see you back here next time for more of the Advisor's Option. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. <laughs>